Hello and welcome to an Atypical Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is a Ukraine war update extra video, but I'm releasing it early in the morning rather than being my last video of the day because I'm away this morning and early afternoon. In fact, I'm recording this last night, so this is not even this morning, but you get my meaning. Anyway, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about, or I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about war crimes. It's not something I, I've spent a lot of time on previously. Uh, but actually, I want to refer you to a fantastic um, Ukraine latest podcast segment. In fact, pretty much the whole podcast was involved with interviewing a couple of people from um, a really very important organization called the Reckoning Project that is detailing uh, war crimes committed in Russia, you know, compiling evidence meticulously uh, and getting firsthand reports and first-hand um, testimonies of that which has taken place. Before I get there, uh, and that's a bit I recorded earlier, I'm, I just want to preface it with this, which is, this is a, an article that came out a good sort of t you know, three weeks ago now, but I, I think it gives you a sense of context here. Uh, the article of CNBC, Russia has committed more than 65,000 war crimes in Ukraine, prosecutor general says. So the sort of summary part, so Ukraine's prosecutor general, Andriy Kostin, said authorities have registered more than 65,000 war crimes since Moscow's conflict began a year ago. He said that crimes include indiscriminate shelling of civilians, willful killing, torture, conflict-related violence, looting and forced displacement on a massive scale. And he also slammed Russian attempts to weaponize the winter season by targeting critical energy infrastructure across Ukrainian cities. So the article says Ukraine's prosecutor General Andre Kostin said Wednesday that regional authorities have registered more than 65,000 war crimes since the conflict began. Quote, we have all witnessed the with horror the evidence of atrocities committed in Butcher, Irpin, Mariupol, Izium, Kherson, Kharkiv regions and other liberated cities and towns. Kostin said, adding that Ukrainian authorities have discovered mass burial sites in areas occupied by Russian troops. Quote, these crimes are not incidental or accidental. They include indiscriminate shelling of civilians, willful killing, torture, conflict-related sexual violence, looting and forced displacement on a massive scale, he added in remarks at the Georgetown Law School in Washington. Uh, in a separate discussion with journalists, Kostin said he believed Kiev was close to gaining US support to establish a special tribunal, tribunal to prosecute Russia's crimes of aggression. Because potential war crimes across a range of jurisdictions, the International Criminal Court, ICC, um, cannot prosecute them or heads of state such as Russian uh, President Vladimir Putin. A special tribunal endorsed by the United Nations Security Council will also seems unlikely since Russia holds veto authority on all measures put forth by the 15-member group. Beth Van Schaak, uh, President Joe Biden's ambassador at large for global criminal justice, said on Wednesday that the US is considering a proposal that would name an interim prosecutor to start recording evidence for of potential crimes that could be used later. Kostin uh, recently said European countries like France and the United Kingdom have agreed to help create a special tribunal. He said his teams have also documented more than 14,000 Ukrainian children forced into adoption in Russia. In fact, Russian authorities during a recent um, rally thing in the stadium in uh, Moscow, where Putin gave a bit of a talk and they had music playing and people were kind of paid to go along. There were reports that people were paid to go along, that students were kind of made to go along to this and fill up the fill up the seats but anyway they paraded a bunch of children there saying these were children you know rescued from ukraine in scare quotes but of course they seem to be children that have gone through kind of filtration camps or of or, or just being outright to, taken straight to to russia to be adopted into russian families and that is, itself is is a huge problem so with that in mind uh we'll move on to what I'd recorded earlier as, as part of a longer extra video, but then I, I've sort of chopped the end off. So it'll say, I'll now go to my last piece, but it's, it's indeed just this piece. And, and uh, yeah, just see, see what you think. So we're going to go to the last, really the last part of this, which is to talk about uh, war crimes. And they, uh, these are just two things on my Twitter thread here that, that just part of the course, this is kind of everyday claims, uh, uh, that that you see concerning 
war crimes in Ukraine. So the Kyiv Independent says Russians have set up a torture chamber in the city of uh, Vasilivka in the occupied part of Zaporizhia Oblast. The general staff said torture chambers have been found in many formerly occupied areas uh, after they've been liberated. The story of one survivor, and then it, it gives you a story of one survivor telling you that, you know, first-hand evidence. Uh, General Staff also say Russia intensifies persecution of civilians in occupied areas. Russians are increasingly pressuring civilians and raiding their homes in the occupied parts of Kherson and Zaporizhia Oblast. The General Staff of the Ukrainian Armed Forces reported on February 25th. This goes back to, you know, when you're arguing people in the threads below who are going to be naysayers, the usual suspects that are pro-Russian or pro-Kremlin voices down below, either bots or people that are anti-West and therefore pro-Kremlin. you like, are you really on the right side? Like, you know, you are aware of the, the sheer volume of war crimes that have been committed. Like the, the, the huge volume. How do you deal with this? Of course, cognitive dissonance reduction means that they will kind of deny it or go, uh, but look over there. What about the Ukrainian war crimes? It's like, yeah, we've got like a handful of claims of Ukrainian war crimes, which we're not denying happened. But I, I, I'm saying you, you really need to see like the difference between 50,000 and like 20. Uh, quite a big difference. So yes, and this is a problem and that should be dealt with. And look, they've they've announced an investigation into that, the Ukrainians. What have the Russians done? Oh, they're just flat out denying or just not saying anything. And there is so much evidence, like actual evidence of war crimes that I don't know how you can you pro-Kremlin voice, I don't know how you can sit there and be a moral agent and say and decry Ukraine and support Russia and then Russia are the ones doing this and the Ukrainians are not the ones doing this. I, d I don't know how you can live with yourself. I This is my ranty bit where I get fed up of, of people like attacking the Ukrainian resistance here to, to maintain their own so sovereign integrity and the support of Ukraine by all their allies. I don't know how you can attack that and still in the knowledge that, and okay, the issue is that you don't have that knowledge because you deny that knowledge or ignore it or bury your head in the sand, but wake up because you can't really support the Russian project with the knowledge that that stuff is going on and still be a moral agent. You're just deeply morally broken. So let's look at a little bit on war crimes. And what I'd advise you do is go to the Ukraine, the latest podcast. And this is from a couple of days ago now. On YouTube, it's it's named as How to Bring War Criminals to Justice. And it's got a, an extended interview with Janine Di Giovanni and Natalia Gomenyuk, which sounds very much like the head of the Southern uh command in in ukraine but i don't think it is but uh these are two people on working well co-founders of the reckoning project and they collect testimonies across ukraine to help bring russian war criminals to justice this the interview is absolutely phenomenal and i just advise you watch this whole episode or listen to this whole episode i'll excerpt a few bits for you uh now um thank you first of all thank you so much for having us on um and to give us a chance to explain what we do at the Reckoning Project. So my name is Janine Di Giovanni. I'm the executive director. Uh, prior to that, I was, I suppose, what you would call a war reporter for more than 30 years, um, reporting about 1920 conflicts, um, including witnessing three genocides um, in Bosnia, Srebrenica, Rwanda, and the Yazidi slaughter. So in many ways, the Reckoning Project was born out of that desire to witness atrocities, but to fight against impunity. This is to say she knows her stuff, like she has experienced war crimes firsthand, as in has interviewed people in a number of different conflicts. Uh, she knows war. She understands war crimes. She's in a very good place to be able to do this uh, work. 
um, Natalia Gumenyuk, um, who will introduce herself next, uh, my co-founder, and Peter Pomerantsev, who's a British academic and journalist. Um, we founded this a few days after the invasion. Um, our goal and our mission is basically to report, document atrocities, and then to build cases. Um, so we basically started um, recruiting investigative journalists from throughout Ukraine. It's very important to us that we use Ukrainian human rights monitors, journalists who have been trained to a high standard to report the atrocities. They're throughout the country. Natalia recruited them. Um, we train them very carefully. Um, and then we basically take witness statements. So far in one year, we have 200, which is double what I thought we could possibly do. And I think what that illustrates is the absolute horrific level of incidents. The Office of the Prosecutor General in Kyiv says there are 65,000 incidents. In all of my time reporting war, and I thought I had seen everything, I have never seen such unprecedented amount of, of crime, of criminal activity. That's absolutely staggering. So someone that, that is deeply knowledgeable about this stuff saying it's just staggering numbers of war crimes taking place. If you are pro-Russian, what's your answer to that? Bury your head in the sand, not good enough. Distract. Look at that. Look at the Ukrainians. What about the Ukrainian war crimes? Not good enough. Just, you know, I, I, I don't know how you can, you can justify your defense of the Russian project here in light of the sheer volume of d disgusting things that, that the Russian forces have done. And it comes from the top down. So we basically take these statements, we then we verify them, and then we begin to build cases, which is the stage we are in right now. And we'll go to listen to another bit in a second, but I just I want to hit hit that home. You have to deal with this. If you are pro-Russian on my threads and you are watching this video, how do you deal with the situation? of up to 65,000 incidents of Russian war crimes. And even if you say, oh, that's exaggerated, okay, 30,000, 20,000. How do you deal with 20,000? Okay, 10,000. How do you deal with 10,000 incidences, incidences of war crimes? How are you a decent moral human being if you support, you know, this kind of activity, people going in and doing horrific stuff to people in another country, waterboarding, electrocution, kidnap. So anyway, we'll uh, go on to play uh, another little excerpt. Before I go to the next part, I mean, just to give a summary of what she says in between, which is one of the goals of this organization is to stamp out impunity. So it's the idea that historically, and I guess there's got to be a lot to be said for in open source intelligence. In fact, there's so much video uh, footage that can be that can be shared, that can be taken and then subsequently shared that the evidence is arguably easier to come by than maybe, say, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, even 20 years ago. Uh, that previously people who have perpetrated war crimes have, have done so thinking that there is this sense of impunity like we can do this and we can get away with it and it, and maybe maybe we might end up in the hague in 20 years time if we're deeply deeply unlucky but ostensibly we can do this and get away with it and that's a, a super important concept so i've talked about this before but one of one of the big people think that harsh punishments are a, a really big deterrent for uh, you know, bad behavior, if you like, uh, and committing crimes, but actually it makes very little difference. Neg neg negligible effect. 
Well, as the biggest effect is the probability evaluation of getting caught. So if you if if you think that you are going to get caught, then you're less likely to do whatever thing it is you're considering doing. So I'm gonna I'm considering going to steal a loaf of bread from from my local shop. There's a 99.9 percent chance of me being caught. I I'll probably think no, I'm not going to steal it. So what it influences my bad behaviour is actually the chance chance of getting caught. Well, if if you are thinking about war crimes. Then that that should like that theory should apply. You would think in that same sort of situation that if if there is a track record of people committing war crimes and being caught for them and being done for them and being hauled over the coals, so to speak. Although I know that sounds a bit like a war crime itself, then that should inform the behaviour, or at least it's got more chance of informing that informing it than anything else. So a project like this is designed to change the the landscape in in terms of wars to to hold people to account to account by pr- producing an awful lot of good quality evidence and getting this to the criminal courts or the, or the international courts as quickly as possible and i think that's what she's sort of t- talking to with regard to when she discusses the the kind of missions and the raison d'etre for uh, the reckoning project and here's the next set so it's quite a long one on the ground being a human rights reporter. Um, But it didn't go deep enough. And I've been called numerous times to The Hague. I've been called by investigators. I keep very careful notes. I often worked for the American media, where, of course, you go through a very extensive fact-checking system. But fact-checking and having a good notebook isn't enough. So I thought there was a way to train highly experienced journalists. And I know Um, Your Telegraph reporters are among the best, Roland, and um, extraordinary reporting. But how do we take it one step further? So how can his reporting be actually admittable to court? Um, There's things that, of course, that you cannot do. Um, First of all, one other thing I just want to add, we're not a journalist training unit. That's not what we do. We're a war crimes unit, um, which also has a multimedia dimension. But we do train journalists in a very specific way. So probably the most important thing is what Natalia just mentioned, trauma. Um, I have seen so many times, and um, unfortunately it's usually television journalists, who go somewhere where there's been a bombing, where there's been a horrific incident, and they begin to just run around trying to get quotes, Um, you know, putting microphone in people's faces who are shaking, who are traumatized. Well, a traumatized victim's evidence will not be able to be used in court because usually their time frame is very mixed up. Um, So we have to ensure that they are not traumatized while we are taking witness statements, but also that we do not re-traumatize them. So the motto at the the Reckoning Project is do no harm. That is first and foremost. The second part is concise, concrete, evidence. So basically, once we train the reporters in trauma, um, not just for the witnesses, but for themselves, it's really important to me. And I'm constantly saying to Natalia, you need to take a break now. You need to take a break. You need to do self-care. Our our monitors have been doing this now for one year. Um, It's very heavy stuff. The, The witness statements that I go through every day are extremely granular. So if you are taking that in on a daily basis, you need to be protected. Um, Everyone knows how PTSD works. Everyone knows the effect of it on war reporters, photographers, cameramen. It's it's very strong. So that's one thing. The second thing, um, no leading questions. So that's something that you have to almost retrain journalists to do because it's almost in a journalist's um, you know, second, like second, uh, you know, the way a journalist would ask a question. When- this is really super important, actually. I, I was uh, interviewing my son and uh, his brother. So tw- I've got twin boys and uh, one of their friends. And I was doing it separately and I was recording the interview because an incident had happened at school and I wanted to get, I had to send an email into into school. Uh, and I wanted to get, I wanted to make sure that their their accounts of what happened were verified and they cohered so on and so forth but i also they're only 12 years old and so their ability to express 
themselves is quite limited compared to the the kind of information that I was needing from them. Needing so again, I'm, I'm this, this issue of leading, and I, and I'd already listened to this interview, and I know about leading questions as well, and so it was really actually very difficult for me to to interview all those three children without asking leading questions because I actually uh, it turns out I had to we had to phone the police and so on and so forth anyway, whatever you're not interested in that but you know so this was this was an account that we were giving to the police and uh, and you know yesterday and it was um it was just really very difficult because I was like yeah you know, when your children just saying it in the kind of way the children say it, and you're thinking, I know that you've experienced more than this, and and because you've told me in another way, and you told me earlier, and I need you to be able to say that in a, in a way that is is true and faithful to what happened, but but also gives me deeper information that I know you have, and so I end up asking you these certain things, but I can't help but ask it in leading ways, and of course, technically. That would be inadmissible in a uh, in a in a court of law. So it's that's just this is a little anecdote to say how difficult it is to to really truly get away from asking leading questions. When you saw the Russian tank coming down the road, but we can't do that. We would say instead, "What happened? What did you see?" So you let you let the witness lead the narrative. You don't really lead it. In terms of accuracy, we, we just had a phase two of our training recently in Ukraine with everyone coming together. And one thing that came up is our lawyer said, um, you know, I don't like the idea of using OSINT to verify things because it really says in a way that the witnesses are not reliable. So what we do instead is we take a lot of time. We're not doing breaking news story. We're not the Associated Press. We're not Reuters we can go back to witnesses. Although there's something to be cautious of here, you can't, the more you re-interview a witness, their story might change. So we have to be extremely careful of that. Um, we train our, our in, um, I keep calling them reporters, but I, I, t I prefer to think of them as human rights monitors now. Um, we train them in, in IHL, International Humanitarian Law. We, we go over past wars with them and examples. And we also do training in, in storytelling so that they can build stories out of our archives. So I think it helps to see the Reckoning Project is at the heart of our work is our, our archives, which are locked down um, and which we use for twofold. One, for the cases which we are building, and the second for, um, for the multimedia platforms. And, you know, in terms of where we're going with international justice mechanisms, we're going for a variety. Um, first and foremost, of course, we work with the Ukrainian, the prosecutor general's office, because it's really important in the same way that it was really important for Natalia, Peter and myself to only use Ukrainian monitors. Why? Because I've seen over the years foreigners, whether they're working for excellent human rights groups like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, um, or even ICC investigators, they're foreigners. You know, they go to a country and they're not, they're not local. It was really crucial for us that we use Ukrainians to give them agency over their justice, of the, their justice system. Um, never before, in my knowledge, have mass atrocities been so heavily investigated. But we wanted to make sure that ours was airtight. We didn't just want to have a website where anyone could post war crimes. That's not what we wanted to do. We wanted it to be extremely um, methodical. This is super important. So they're doing a really serious project here. They're, they are taking this super, super seriously. And this will be, I mean, the intention is that this is going to be admissible in an international court of human rights or however you prosecute war crimes you need to dot the i's and cross the t's here and if she is then saying this is like 
the worst set of war crimes I've ever seen or the like more war crimes or whatever. Then and she's taking this really seriously and and doing a really proper job in compiling all this evidence. Then if again, if you are pro Russian, you need to take this seriously. Like this isn't just some some YouTuber like saying, Oh, there are loads of war crimes in Russia. What what do you say about that, Russian? This is this is somebody who is deeply involved in compiling the huge wealth of evidence um, that there is war crimes and and presenting that. So go and check, you know, the work that the Reckoning Project are doing. And and again, what is your answer? Um, so our data analyst, once we get the witness statements. Um, once the report, uh, the human rights monitors do their work, they then create these statements. The statements then go to me and our, um, our data analyst, who is a Syrian based outside of Ukraine. And we very, very carefully go through them for patterns. We then will use some form of OSINT for verification. If we need it, for instance, are there military, were there military vehicles nearby? Or if we need photographs, aerial photographs or audio or in some cases with the children, can we get documents that verify chain of command and intent? Then we're beginning to work on the tribunal. So whether or not we go for the special tribunal, the crime of aggression, the so-called leadership crime, um, which looks more and more viable, uh, whether or not we go for um, a special hybrid court, whether it's a national court in Ukraine, a local court, even the ICC, these are all things we're looking at. And in particular, I'm very interested in universal jurisdiction. Um, so that's really where. So, uh, and the, the, she talks in the talk about genocide, talks about all these sort of different areas of war crimes, but, you know, it's super serious stuff. Um, but there's, there's more to listen to. With this level of sensitivity. I think also something we're, we're looking at quite carefully is filtration camps. That's another thing. And one other theme is hate rhetoric. Um, we're beginning to look very carefully at how hate rhetoric could play into the propaganda, even Putin's statements. I, I never used to pay attention to anything, to statements, but his statements are full of so much incitement. So that is something without giving too much away on our future projects. That's another thing. And again, if some of your listeners may remember in Rwanda, Radio Milkulin, which was a direct incitement to, to the genocide. So these are some other larger themes the Reckoning Project is, is looking ahead at. Yeah, not too much I can add to that, but, you know, it's connecting the dots. And with this kind of work they're doing, you are going to have the people on, on, on the ground, if you like, committing these war crimes. But, but it's, again, looking up the chain to see whether there is uh, responsibility from those higher up and how you prove that responsibility. And obviously they're going to know what they're doing, but ostensibly this this there is there is at least some of these war crimes will be sanctioned and even ordered from from high up or known about and not not actioned uh, and so on and so forth so there is going to there there is going to be a huge amount of of work to be done uh to to you know prove a corporate uh, responsibility and culpability here uh just one more little section Natalia, is there anything we haven't talked about that you would want to mention at this point before we go to Francis for some final updates? Um, I think I'd, I just would like to point out again that um, really Ukraine is the first war that, that I've witnessed where there has been such um, absolute extraordinary investigations going on um, on the mass atrocities. And I do believe that this is a turning point for international justice. I really believe that we're leaving behind an era of impunity where grievous crimes happened and we walked away from it and we closed our eyes. And I think Ukraine is completely changing the, the monitor for that. I think we're entering a new era of accountability. And I'm very proud the Reckoning Project is, is at the forefront of that. I probably... 
and, and I recognise that I haven't actually played any excerpts there from Natalia Gumenyuk. So go and watch the whole thing or, or listen to the whole thing and see what both of them have to say. But I just thought those uh, particular excerpts distilled down what, what these guys are doing. And hopefully you recognise how important that is. And also recognise that Ukraine is a bit of a game changer. The, the, the amount of of evidence that can be collected in this modern era of technology is incredible, but also the very uh, timely manner that they're doing it in, uh, these guys helping to do that. It's not a case of waiting till the war is over, making sure it's safe to go in the country, then going in like after it's happened and it's all often too late and you're trying to compile this evidence and you're, you're uh, external people who don't speak the language and you go it's all very very difficult and and the quality of evidence may be poor but this is like we're going to use ukrainians there, there's not going to be a language barrier issue in fact you know you, there, there's going to be some trust going on there and, and they could they'll feel um, more ease to divulge what they know and we can do that straight away and they, they even in this they talk about getting information from behind lines as well so it's not just about uh, the things that have happened in areas that have been liberated but it's also trying to get information from people who who are presently behind o occupied lines and in the occupied territories it's super super important uh, and yeah i just ask that you go and listen to the whole thing but again you know are you on the right side if you are pro Kremlin here, are you on the right side? How how do you deal with all of this? And there was even I, I've not talked about it. There is some talk about different types of war crimes. I mean, I, I don't need to go into all the detail of what war, how torture happens, how people are having parts of their bodies attached to electrodes, so on and so forth. Um, you know, uh, a friend was telling me today how he was. He was hearing of, you know, a, a guy that was in a, um, a Ukrainian soldier that had been taken to a hospital behind the lines, and then they were just kept repeatedly coming into the hospital and basically had open bones and stuff, and were just like twisting his broken bones that were open, just like repeatedly doing that day after day. And you're thinking, is this guy really going to have much information to get? I mean, here's a guy fighting on the front lines. You might know some things about what's going on locally, but I just think, but. Thank you for watching that. That was just one uh, segment on one topic uh, of war crimes. And there's, you know, vastly more that can be said, uh, given that there are that many war crimes purportedly being committed and quite a lot of evidence to support the claims of those war crimes. Um, but it, that's food for thought anyway. Uh, what a worthy organisation by the sounds of it, uh, the Reckoning Project, and I hope... Uh, you know, they, they get all the support they can to do that really, really important work. There's going to be so much work to be done after the war is over in terms of, you know, how do you go? It depends what happens with Russia, of course. Uh, but getting children back from Ukraine, getting families back from, sorry, from Russia, getting families back from Russia who have been filtered through these filtration camps. Uh, what do you do with the Donbass? What do you do with Crimea? How, you know, it's a really long-term project getting Ukraine back on its feet You know, at, at, at the end of this war, which, you know, can't come soon enough. You were, I mean, that's assuming that Ukraine will prevail. I can't see it going any other way realistically. It's just how much pain and, and suffering will take place before before this gets resolved. And can it get resolved without Putin doing something ridiculous? Uh, anyway, uh, thank you. Please like, subscribe and share. Uh, hopefully get out a, a frontline update a little bit later. Uh, and uh, a, a news segment at the wrong end of, of my trio of videos. Anyway, take care. Speak soon. Mm -hmm.